So first of all, let me welcome you to Powerhouse Conversations. You are our third episode, okay. our third fabulous alum who is uh, doing some amazing things in the world today. Um, but let me just say, in reading your bio and everything that you have going on, um, wow. Because I'm able to meet a lot of great people, but when I get to kind of dive in and do some homework about what uh, mm -hmm. we are doing, uh, as like I said, I'm a, a foster alum myself, and um, it's good to hear those success stories, right? So it's good to hear those those things. Right. So it is nice um, to hear that. And it looks like you've been you hit the ground not only running but knocking down barriers um with the different degrees you have some of the work you've been doing uh, the in-depth analysis and forecasting for clients i mean like all that stuff is, is pretty interesting um so where i want to start is i want just tell tell us about your work okay um I work for Cornerstone Government Affairs. It's a uh, bipartisan lobbying firm or public relations and lobbying firm. Um, we have over 10 offices nationally and myself and um, my colleague run our Maryland office, which is based in Annapolis, Maryland, our state capital. Um, and I am the senior vice president there. I have, um, um, and what Cornerstone basically does is, um, or what I do at Cornerstone, is lobbying work. And that's representing as clients before the um, legislature, the governor, and state administrative agencies. Um, and and uh, I also do some federal work, um, depending on what the client needs. And local work as well. So, in fact, I have a meeting coming up to discuss some li um, some lobbying that needs to be done before the Baltimore City Council. So, it is um, it it's it runs the gamut. And certainly, since we are a national firm, sometimes I um, do travel and do some work um, outside of the state of Maryland and outside of the district. So, yeah. Awesome. So, how did you get into how did, I mean, before Cornerstone Government Affairs, where did the Laura start? Where'd you get your start? Or what was some of your mo your motivation for um, acquiring your law degree? You know, where did, where, where did all that aspiration come from? Yeah. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll kind of answer this a little, little bit differently than I would, I guess, if I was talking to a different audience. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because the primary reason for pursuing uh, a law degree, there were some really kind of standard kind of things that motivated me. So I'll talk about academically, right? So an undergraduate, I had an interest in healthcare law and healthcare, healthcare policy, I also was not very strong in math, but I knew I wanted to do an, get an advanced degree and I became interested in policy. So um, I took a course in healthcare law and policy and um, I suggested that I should look into law school. And that's what piqued my interest in law school. I never really fell completely in love with the practice of law. But I really kind of held on to the policy aspect. I thought it was really interesting how you could shape policy um, on the front end as opposed to litigating on the back end or framing um, the law. Well, not um, the law, but framing facts around the law as opposed to framing the law from the outset. Right. Um, and how that affects day-to-day uh, -day lives for people. So. That's one part of it. The second part was really that when I was in college, you know, it was, um, I think, like most young people who may have aged out of the system or, you know, in their starting school and you're, and you're there for the semester. And when the semester is over, um, 
you kind of think about, well, where am I going to live? Or what am I going to do? Am I going to be able to afford my meal plan? Or I got tuition. What about food? You know, we worry about a lot of things. What about health care at the time? That was before the expansion of um, health care to young people until age of 26 if you're in foster care. So I did not have health care. Um, yeah, and I had a... Right, right. So mm-hmm. I was ill in college a lot, and I was just stuck. I was just in the uh, in the in the in the school like what their little nurse service is called. I was right. like always in there in the building. So, yeah. but in any, I'm I'm rambling. Right. That's all right. What I'm That's right. At, <laughs> what I'm getting at is that I. I was keenly aware from a very early age and from, you know, being in foster care that I really had to pursue a career that provided some stability for me um, that would allow me to take care of myself, Mm -hmm. allow me to, you know, um, change my circumstances. And so that's how I settled on the law. Right. Um, I would have loved to like gone to school for like dance, <laughs> but <laughs> that was just not practical for me. Um, and that's not to say I couldn't have made a good living doing it. It's just, I had to really have more of a sure bet. Um, it wasn't something I could really deviate from. So with that said, um, I was very strategic. I made sure that in undergrad, I had all of my scholarships set up and I wasn't, you know, incurring any debt in undergraduate because I knew I wanted to go to graduate school. And for the law degree, but all of that additional kind of context or flavor is there to say that there are a lot of things that you learn um, being in foster care where you make decisions a little bit differently mm-hmm. at a much younger age, right? Because your considerations are more or less more like adult considerations um, instead of the considerations of a young person. So um, that's what. That's what drove me to the law or made me go in that direction. <clears throat> so I heard dance and, uh, and the possible career in dance. So did you have a small passion for for the arts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I was in high school, I played on the jazz concert and marching bands. And I played trombone. And I was... <laughs> First, I was you yeah I love brass brat like playing brass and I um I did I I was first chair most of my time on jazz band trombone brass okay. section it was it, yes, it was the best so I love like things like dancing painting arts like all of that stuff I love and that's not to say that you know other people don't make those decisions. You know, people make those decisions every day. They don't have to be in foster care. Like they're like, okay, I'm going to go be an engineer. I'm not going to go and you know, people make those right. decisions all the time. So it's not anything unique to foster care. I just think that it's a consideration um, that I made in my circumstances because of right. So um, yeah, no, I love all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. That's- and I think that's where you are now my best friend because I, I am a band <laughs> um, He's like, we're not my best friends. Like, right, we're it. not best friends. <laughs> I went to college and uh, I'm a percussionist. Mm-hmm. So, and I was in oh, every ensemble. Go. I was in every ensemble you can think of from percussion ensemble yeah. to band ensemble to mallet percussion ensemble to concert band. Yeah, I did it all. Wow. Um, wow. So oh, it, yeah. it's uh it, it was a, it's definitely still a passion. It's still something I, I dabble in, but um yeah, it's I get it. That's why I say I, I kinda held on to that held on to that dance because something <laughs> something about the arts and you can hear and you can kind of feel oh, yeah. uh, that passion mm-hmm. to anyone who's ever been involved in the arts. So oh, that yeah. was like my go to. That was my getaway. And that's right. how I got look, and that's how I got away. Wasn't That's it? right. Um, That's right. So it's a, it's a beautiful here. thing. Same here. That in books. That was a good escape. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, books wasn't. I that just. Yeah, that wasn't. <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't. Was, <laughs> you know, it's one of the things like, I had to do. You know, like now, um, I'm currently writing a book now, and it's like 
it's a, it's a struggle more because of, of the time and then getting writer's block. But it's like, well, if you've never been one to love to love to read like leisurely, it's kind of a it's it's, it's harder. It's harder. So it's, for sure, it's something, work, it's something that I'm working through. That's um, all right. So, we all on our journey. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what are some of the roadblocks um, that you feel you've overcome uh, in your journey, whether it be early on or once you've gotten into your career? Um, you can pick and choose wherever you want to start. But what are some of your uh, your strongest roadblocks you've overcome? So I think there were there were a few. Um, certainly when I was in college and I, I touched on just at the end of some, the some, like having a stable kind of old fix. Um, so when I was old enough to have my own like home, like that was so important. That was so, Mm -hmm. even now, um, I'm thinking about moving and I would never sell my home. Because I, it's it's just so important to me to have that home base. When I was in college, um, it was just very difficult. At the end of semester, everybody's worrying about finals. Everybody's worrying about where they're going to go for summer or where they're going to, like, vacation, right? Not, Mm -hmm. like, where am I going to live? That's what I was worried about. (laughs) I was like, okay, let me just put my belongings (laughs) into trash bags and figure out is someone will let me couch surf until next semester. So, you know, because the way college is structured with the semesters, when to go somewhere, but not long enough to really, like, rent, like, have a contract with anyone to rent anything. It was, like, six weeks or something like that. Something arbitrary. Um, So that was always a challenge. Um, we didn't have things like we have now, like Airbnb, not that I could probably afford that as a college student to do that for six weeks, but we just didn't have the same kind of, um, availability of networks where, you know, people rent rooms or things like that. It was just really difficult, um, not having a home base, not having that stability, Mm -hmm. um, as a young person, that was a big hurdle. Another big hurdle, I think, um, was when I turned 21, I, um, I only have one sibling and I had him come live with me because I didn't want him to go into foster care. And that was a huge hurdle. I think I had no idea what it would be like to try and raise a young person, a young teenager, um, also, while attending law school, he came to live with me two weeks before I started law school. And, and that was kind of like the first case I ever worked on. And that was a tremendous hurdle. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was tough. And looking back on it now, like I was 21, he was 14. And uh, we were just, I don't know what we thought we were doing, but we made it work. Mm-hmm. Um, but that was a huge hurdle. That was a huge hurdle for like young, any young person that has to take care of themselves and then themselves and then also take care of someone else, be it their child or their parent or their sibling, whomever. Um, that's that's a big hurdle. It is. But and I take it that, of course, things didn't go off without a hitch, but there was something valuable that came out of that situation. Absolutely. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had, um, because I entered care when I was 13, and prior to that, I was taking care of a sibling of mine, Um, Mm -hmm. and I tell you, when you're 11 and 12 trying to take care of a a newborn, it's it's difficult, but I, Mm -hmm. you know, and I joke about this now, but I'm in, I'm in, uh, I do a lot of pre-service training for new and prospective foster parents, and, you know, one thing I always tell them, I said, the biggest skill I learned before entering care was being able to know how to use cloth diapers effectively. So <laughs> I'm hey, a you never know. You <laughs> gotta know these things. But most adults have a hard time taking care of, of, of an infant, let alone an eleven year old. So yeah. 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 
So looking again, looking back at everything you've you've accomplished and um, what were you know, we talked about what compelled you to become to go into law. But what are some things that you feel that you're not very good at? You know, we talk Mm -hmm. about being being strength based and and um, always thinking about things. What am I not good at? Well, we established that I'm not great at this technology situation. We've already <laughs> <laughs> we already figured this out. So that's one. Um, <laughs> I'm not really good about um I'm sorry, my cat is in the background making yeah. noises. Um, <laughs> I'm not really good about going to bed on time. I am a night owl. I'll, I'll, I'll know that, like, I'll, every night I have this calculation, like, well, if I go to bed at this time, I'll get five hours. Or if I, I just am most productive at night. So I would probably say going to bed on time and being disciplined in that way. And that sounds like a small thing, but it can be really a big thing <laughs> because, you know, it you're on a different time than everyone else. Um, so it's not unusual for me to be up working in the middle of the night, you know, and, and doing random stuff that I've decided that must be done at 2 a.m. in the morning that could easily be done at 2 in the afternoon. But, um, yeah, I don't know why I do that. <laughs> I do it. And, so um, I get it. <laughs> you do it? Okay. Yeah, I do it. Okay. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, there, there, are some, there are quite a few things I'm not good at. But, you know, we're always striving to improve. Um, I could be better at public speaking, I think. I have a lot of public speaking engagements. And I think there's definitely room for improvement there. Um, I get really bad nerves, so I'd like to work on that. So that's a, those are a few things. I can help you with that. <laughs> I, oh, okay. I can help. I can help. I do. I get um, nerves. Yeah. Well, and there's a few, like, I know early, early on, because I've been speaking for about 15 years, and I used to get this, this feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I was like, well, how can I, how can oh. I use that? How can I use that as more energy? to do like a fabulous job, but you know, still be critical of myself. So it's like, I, I've learned how to turn that around as that mm-hmm. adrenaline. Then it just being, okay, it's, you know, oh, those, those nerves, look, those nerves that, you know, you're sitting at the podium, you're like, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. But it's, again, it's something that I, I've had to learn, but I've also said that I swear, I am mm-hmm. the most comfortable person on stage. Um, Mm. Years ago, I had the opportunity to coach uh, some elementary school basketball, boys and girls. And you can ask my wife, I said, I would rather be on stage in front of a million people than coach this game right now. (laughs) I I mean, that was just. (laughs) Wow. Like, really? Yes. And I was serious. And I was like, well, no, I'd rather. Yeah, please put me in front of uh, 10,000 people and I will feel a lot more comfortable than being on the floor coaching these kids right now. Um, but I think it, it, it was a purpose. It, you know, I, it's a purpose. And, and I think being able to tell uh, my story and to help someone is what makes it so cur- comfortable for me. Well, you, you made me think of one more thing that I'm not good at. I'm not good at telling my story. And that's a new phenomenon, right? Mm, like, okay. This just started, this just started maybe 10 months ago okay. where I've become a little bit more comfortable with telling my story. It's not something that I would freely discuss. Like it would come up in different contexts, mm-hmm. um, but it's not something I would freely discuss at all. Okay. So, so would you say that you... You didn't. You purposely didn't tell your story, or kind of let people in, in not necessarily in fear of them judging you, but um, 
So what was the motive to kind of keep it internal? Okay. I missed some of the question because you were breaking up, but I think you said that is the reason why I don't share it is because I'm concerned about their reaction. Was that the question? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, no, it's, it, I think it's less about them than it is about me. Okay. I think, um, being in foster care for me held there was a lot of shame associated with it. Um, and so it wasn't, I, because it's not like anyone ever really gave me a negative reaction to the news or this new piece of information um, that I was in foster care or I was in care until I aged out or any of that. I think it's the context. It's it's the other questions that are part of that or the answers that are part of that. Mm-hmm. Less than about the foster care. The foster care, you know, that was just a circum that was just kind of the um the the symptoms or the the end kind of diagnosis from all of the other problems that came to be to get me there. Right. It was all the problems is where the shame came from. Um, you know, so questions like I'll, I'll tell you a, sh- a very brief story about when I started college and I was moving in all my stuff and my roommate's parents, you know, they're they're working with their daughter to move her stuff in. And at one point, um, I, I can't remember the mom or the dad, but he was like, what kind of parents let you move in by yourself? Where are your parents? Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's just kind of like, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I mean, even if he did see, feel there was a problem with it, if my parents were around, I don't know if that was the best way to approach it. Yeah. Um but just instances like that where I don't know if I actually even said anything to him about it. Usually I just kind of ref- deflect because people can become very intrusive and they want to ask questions. And I don't even want to get into the whole like life story of very personal family information with strangers, essentially what it usually is. Mm-hmm. So because of those kinds of interactions um, is where I guess along the way I took on a lot of shame about it. And as an adult was not very comfortable discussing it at all. And I I think that's okay. And where I'm, where I'm happy you, you, you kind of explaining it because a lot of our brothers and sisters that are in care now feel the same way. They feel that if they do self-disclose that they've been in care, that they will be looked at, you know, the problem that, you know, they can't be successful. And, you know, we have some amazing programs out here. Uh, I know here in Ohio, we have, um, we have mentorships for youth who experience care on a lot of our campuses. And the issue is a lot of our youth aren't taking advantage of those, of those opportunities because of the shame, you know? Oh, wow. I thought it was just because they just didn't know about it. It's because... <laughs> yeah, yeah, part of it. Like, especially if I could get a free education, which I did, you know what I mean, an undergrad. Mm-hmm. No. Now, that that shame, it wasn't that much shame. But <laughs> as far as, like, daily conversation, <laughs> right. like, with a stranger, I didn't feel like I had the right to have just all of this piece of information about me. Yeah, I was just like, mm, I'll pass. <laughs> yeah, I think one, one of the things I know that we do, we do fairly well here in Ohio is, again, provide the, that supportive network. You know, the only way a lot of us get right. through is because we're able to connect with people who not only are like minded, but have similar experiences. And mm-hmm. when you're able to to check in and bounce off ideas and emotions and feelings, about those mm-hmm. traumas that we've all had. I mean, it, 
one, it helps me connect and say, oh, well, let me go back because I know there's people there that are like me. Mm -hmm. And again, some of the issues are not that they don't know the services are there because Mm -hmm. they are still operating within that stigma of let me hold this to myself because I don't want anybody to shame me. So I think that's still, that's still, I think nationally, just a big hurdle. So yes. what brings up an, another question, how do we dispel the stigma of our experiences of being in care? I think we have to kind of, you know, everybody has their own, their own process. Um, it took me a while. It took me a long while. Um, But we just have to really kind of, I think it's hard to put it on young people, very, especially very young people, right? Because kids can be so cruel and they're already dealing with so much. Um, But I think that for those of us who age out of the system and we're living our lives and we're trying to make it happen just like everybody else, um, I think it's important to have those conversations. It's especially important in my experience, to have it with young people who are in care. So while they might not feel like talking about it, if they're able to talk to someone who had been in their shoes and and um, and kind of went on and are, are doing just fine, and they say, you know, maybe all the things that I think about myself or maybe all of the things that I've been told about myself are not true, you know, or maybe you know, there's a different kind of narrative. Um, and it's it's really going to come down to us telling our stories um, and being confident in doing so. Um, and I think that's why organizations um, like Shalita's and people like Shalita are so important um, for that reason. Right. Right. Because Mm -hmm. even if you're not quite comfortable, even if you're not quite there, um, there are people that that are kind of not only telling your story and the story of millions of other people, but telling it in a in a way that is, you know, very personable and very easily understood. Um, and, and with a certain empathy that perhaps someone else who has not been in that in 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 the in in care can really understand, um, you know. So I think that's very important, and I think that's how it gets done. We have to; it's our story to tell, um, and we have to take ownership of that and agency of it so love that answer <laughs> love that answer mm-hmm. so it's no secret you will be um joining us at our 2018 alumni powerhouse networking conference uh hitting yeah. the stage as we talk about the whole public speaking uh, uh <laughs> ordeal yeah um, <laughs> so give us give us some insight on on some of the things you're going to be touching on or is it a secret? Oh, and, and, and say again? I said, or is it a secret? No, it's not a secret. It's not a secret. I, I had not thought about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I had not thought about it yet. Um, but since you've given me the opportunity to give it some thought, um, I think what I want to do is, is just talk a little bit about um, really what your last your last question kind of talk kind of kind of lent itself to is mm-hmm. having agency over your story and telling it but not just telling it but why are you telling it okay so in my work which we touched on in the beginning i do advocacy on legislation and things like that you know it's very interesting to listen to the debate on bills that have to do with children in care, Mm -hmm. right? Whether or not 
uh, this year there was a bill introduced in the Maryland General Assembly that would disallow the um, Maryland Department of Social Services from using the dollars that young people receive from their parents via Social Security or any kind of pension, dollars that have been set aside for them for their care. And instead, that money would be redirected for them to have um, when they age out um, or some percentage of it, as opposed to all of it being taken by the state to use for their care. And it's funny. It's like the conversation is, well, you know, there's a lot of they's. They, 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 right? Because nobody knows who these foster care are. Their foster care children are. They're just like these like the the ideas that people have about children in foster care yeah. is like right out of you know like, or like it's, I'm just like what do you what do you how do you think this works um, or or Annie or something like that they just have this very warped view um, about foster kids about foster children um, adults who were in the foster care system and what they're up to right. Mm-hmm. Um, so the conversation is very detached. It's and and it's detached because they don't they don't know anyone in foster care, or they don't think they do. They don't think that maybe you know four or five kids that they went to high school with were in foster care when they were in high school. They had no idea because they came to school and they went home and they didn't tell anyone, right? right. Um, so they don't know those things. And so there, there's a very kind of detached view about foster care children and what their needs are and, you know, things like that and what it's really like in the drug to, you know, do things that other young people do. Um, and so I think <laughs> talking about why it's important to tell the story, how it changes perspectives, how it opens up a dialogue for consideration for young people who are in care now, because they are having to deal with so much and to have to also advocate for themselves as well. It's just, it's, it's, it's a bridge too far. I mean, we're already asking so much of these young people. Um, And I think so for the alumni, for the people who have been there, done that, um, I think really focusing on where in your community or your life can you, you create a space for that voice to change the life of young person in foster care. Yeah, it's it is crazy because um, as we speak, uh, a bill that I've myself and other colleagues here in the state um, have been working on a federal bill for housing for youth aging out of care. And right now it's sitting in front of the subcommittee, the housing subcommittee mm-hmm. on Capitol mm-hmm. Hill right now. Um, with testimony wow. from us and um, we couldn't, a lot of us, a couple of us couldn't get back to DC to actually be there in the flesh and we wish we could. But um, it, it's a bill that will help us partner with the public housing authorities to give aging out youth homes and to shut off wow. this, this faucet of foster care and homelessness and right you know, but it but it takes our story like you know we just spent a week in dc like we do we do every year we take not only alumni alumni supporters but we also take youth that are currently in care to meet with our legislators and to tell our story but not only just tell our story for like you said for what but we're coming with a solution you know uh, and if you look at a lot of the, the child welfare policies that have passed in the past, it's been the youth voice that has helped those things move forward. Mm-hmm. And I want, I, you know, me personally, I want our brothers and sisters to take into account how valuable their voice really is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think a good example of that is the whole gun lobbying thing. Um, with, with our young people walking out of school, you know, to uh, to oppose, you know, gun rights and things like that, uh, and how powerful 
their voice has put the NRA on notice. Like, right. if you really think about the grand scheme of things, the NRA is actually fighting children. And it's crazy. And it's crazy, but it's something that is much needed. And where, again, youth that are currently coming through care, they need to know that their voice is so powerful that they can create and inject change the way that the youth of the country is doing now against gun rights. So it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. The babies are fired up. And I mean, rightfully so. Rightfully so. I mean, they sat around now. They ain't been around long, but they sat around for about five years and watched the grown-ups do it the wrong way. So they said they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna set them straight. And I, I'm here for it. I think it's yeah. fantastic. I do too. I do too. And uh, and, and I know you are a very busy young woman, and I want to ask you one final question. All right. Okay. And that question is on a scale from one to ten. Mm-hmm. How weird, how weird are you? Oh, I'm very weird. I'm a weird, oh my God. <laughs> like, it's not even, without a doubt, my friends always tell me how weird I am. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I kind of, I revel in it. I don't, you know, I, I feel like there's a certain level of freeness in being weird and being who you are and doing your own thing and just, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, be weird. I think it should be more weirdness in the world. I do. <laughs> yes. People call me weird because I literally have a song for every situation. Like, things will be happening. <laughs> and I start rapping or start singing a song that fits that situation. And they look at me like, you're weird. I'm like, <laughs> You know, you can't be my friend if you can't handle these outbursts. I'm I'm sorry. This is just what you this is what you get. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I you know, that you got to do it sometimes. No, I'm I'm definitely I, it's pretty high up there. I put it I put it at an 8. It's pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an 11. I I you know, I'm not ashamed. Oh! <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not ashamed. I know so sometimes You're my weird can be off the scale. Yes. You're, okay. Okay. You know. <laughs> so, but and you'll see the weird when uh, we all come together in June. I know I'm looking forward to it. I know the viewers are looking forward to it. Um, but we just want to we want to thank you. We want to thank you for everything that you've done, everything that you're doing, and want to send you that that world of encouragement um, because I know what you do is not easy. And also, you know, being able to get out there and tell your story, you know, also isn't as easy, but it's, it's one of those things that I think is needed. It's one of those things that I think is needed. Um, okay. Thank you. So again, thank you for taking, carving out some time out of your day to speak with us and, you know, the powerhouse conversations and uh, you're definitely a powerhouse and uh, we thank you for spending <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right. So we'll talk soon.